I'm now going to introduce the second part of uh, our subject this morning, um, linked in very closely with, with, uh, with Jay, what Jane's done. Um, and may I introduce, first of all, Hassan Adnan, and he will be followed shortly with, by Tony Wardle. So we're, we're getting two for the price of one here today. Um, <laughs> Hassan. Thank you, Alan. Good afternoon. Uh, this presentation will be shared between me and my colleague, Tony Wardle. I'm the head of learning and leadership development at BAT Globally, and Tony Wardle is a learning innovation and technology manager, but he keeps on changing role every year, so he is changing it again soon. Uh, I will take you through a journey of two and a half years at British Mac and Tobacco, which is about the learning transformation journey. As a global business, we, we transformed our learning and leadership development. And it is important to understand in that wider context because uh, it had a number of elements. It had the competencies, learning management system, leadership development. And there was a reason why we packaged it in that way, because we had to make it attractive to the global stakeholders so they have the right hook to buy in, in, into this transformation as well. So in terms of the content, uh, the first half of this presentation, about 10 minutes, I will give you an overview of the learning transformation, also the context, uh, why we were doing, and what was our strategic intention uh, in terms of achieving the business benefit. Then we actually have a one minute video as well, which will give you a flavor of how does it look like, how does it feel, how, you know, uh, how, what is in it there, what is the content in there, and how the process works. And then I will hand it over to my colleague, Tony Wardle, who will come in and drill a bit deeper into the competencies and how do they link into talent management, development, recruitment, and other areas within the company as well. As we go on, we'll try to share some of the lessons learned as well. Uh, and especially at the end, then, we have one slide. Uh, many of those you would find are common across many companies, so something we could learn from each other if you are embarking on similar journey as well. Right, starting with a very brief introduction of BAT, and that's again part of the context. BAT is a global company. We are present in 180 countries in the world, selling over 200 brands. More importantly, we have 60,000 people spread in these 180 countries. We have 12,000 managers, and we are a highly global metrics organization. So we have regions, we have global functions, and HR is supporting all of these uh, as a business partner. In terms of the financial performance, BAT has been one of the strongest performers on FTSE over the last 10 years. So, this slide, I'll try to paint a picture. Uh, where were we? When I say where were we, I'm looking at 2009. So the journey that we took was really starting around 2009, and then we, uh, over the two and a half years period, we have not only delivered, uh, and now in the phase of embedding it in the organization. So BAT had been very highly dependent on face-to-face -face learning, so very highly dependent face-to-face, -face, uh, bringing people to classroom training, and it worked in the past. So has been very strong on talent management and talent development, but the way we were doing it, we were duplicating a lot of effort and wasting a lot of money as well. And the reason is because we were very self-sufficient in terms of our L&D approach and capabilities in the end markets, in the regions, and in the functions. And that's because of the history of BAT as well. BAT has been a federation of operating companies. And traditionally, we have been self-sufficient in managing our own talent, learning, leadership development strategies in the big markets, in the regions, in the global function as well. The global talent at that time was primarily looking after a set of international programs and bringing in about 1,100 to 1,200 people globally every year to UK for the international programs. Other than that, the end markets and regions were pretty self-sufficient, and they had the capabilities in delivering the full portfolio. As a result, we had 
20 different versions of change management. We had 20 different versions of communication. We had, you know, so they were all over the place. And then the global functions also moved or stepped into the competencies a few years back. So some of those functions had their competency frameworks. They were not consistent. These competency frameworks had mix of behavioral competencies as well as items from role profiles. So they were pretty much all over the place. And then operations, which was the first function to have successfully rolled out the competency framework globally, when they got all the data back from the system previously we were using, uh, they had more than 60,000 data lines on Excel to analyze. And then the whole organization was waiting, and we were not able to make a sense out of that data. So those were the challenges we had. At the same time, the functions are moving into more and more blended approach as well. Uh, so some of the functions had introduced finance learning zone, marketing learning zone. And as HR, we were quite a few steps behind. But the biggest issue was there wasn't a consistent approach. It wasn't integrated. And we were duplicating a lot of effort and energy around it. Finally, the point here in terms of uh, the picture here, when we started looking at it, there wasn't any visibility. There wasn't any way of accumulating, aggregating. What are we spending on learning? What is the impact of learning? Because we didn't have a global single, single system in the company. So we had 250 plus leadership programs in the company. And we had 16 plus learning systems in the company at that time. So with that, we started looking at what is our strategic intent and what do we want to achieve. So one of the first key thing that we wanted to achieve was link all our learning and leadership development to business strategy and competency framework. So as long as we are able to anchor it to the business strategy and leadership and learning competencies, that was the first intention that we said we want to have. Because in the previous world, we were doing development planning, but that was not linked to the competencies. We were not able to track. We were not able to look at what is the impact of learning and doing all of the development planning. So we wanted to link that. We wanted to move towards uh, fully integrated talent processes and also move from a very limited coverage of our learning into more total management development or total workforce development. So world-class learning is available to all people easily at the point of need as well. And finally, we wanted to leverage the technology to enable this as well. Uh, now, that was the intention. And over the two and a half years, what we have delivered are four key things, or I would say three, three key things that we wanted to deliver. One is a streamlined leadership portfolio. So we have brought down the 250 plus leadership program to less than 30 programs in a global leadership framework. So someone was asking earlier, so we had the leadership competency model uh, scaled and defined for the whole organization. And then all our leadership curriculum is mapped against the competency framework. So we have delivered that. We have introduced one single learning management system. So we chose Cornerstone on Demand. So we have from 16 plus moved to one learning management system. And we have one competency framework introduced in the organization for all functional competencies as well as leadership competencies. So one consistent framework and methodology, but the content is driven and owned by the respective business people. And finally, in the process, we have delivered 4 million annual saving in 2011. So now I will give you a brief introduction of L&D integrated uh, process. How does it look like? So if you look at the three boxes here in the dark blue, um, all that's, that's the major content we have on this system now. So we have all the competence assessments, which are anchored against the business strategy and the competency frameworks. And this is a common methodology we have on the system. So the frameworks are there. People carry out the assessments. When they carry out the assessments, because the competency frameworks are linked to the learning and leadership content, so the system suggests them 
according to their gaps, what learning they should be considering. So they have already recommendations. They sit down with the line manager, agree it, and put that into development plans. So that was a big achievement for us, that it's all integrated. They use, leverage the technology to do the whole process. And actually, the system is linked with our HR management system for the management population. And then it gives us uh, reports which are very meaningful. One of the biggest or most important report for us is really getting to know the strengths and gaps on the leadership and functional competencies because that tells us where the gaps are and how can we channelize our leadership learning spend into the right channels. So that really helps us to go for targeted development planning. So that's the biggest one. And now I will share the video, but before I share the video, a couple of comments here. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a journey full of challenges. So today we can stand here looking back, smile at it, and talk to you about this, but there were loads of challenges. I'll talk about a couple here, uh, and then Tony will bring it up later in his presentation as well. Uh, many of you probably would have gone through similar experiences as well. How many have, have you gone through a similar experience and implemented in your organization? Okay. That's great. So there's a lot of experience in this room. And how many are currently going through or planning to do something similar? Right. I mean, my advice is that there's a lot of learning out there. You will have specific issues and challenges in your organization, but you can learn and see what strategies you uh, deploy in terms of overcoming those challenges. The two that I will mention here is one, is the big stakeholder engagement. That's never enough. In a global metrics, 180 markets, regions and functions, very powerful, no solid reporting line into the global talent or my role at that stage. You know, it's a, it's a massive challenge to manage that. And I think what really worked for us was that we, our, our scope actually became bigger, but that allowed us to hook these stakeholders for a specific thing that they were interested in. So global functions were more interested in getting the best out of their competency frameworks and getting the analysis through the system. Some of the other regions were interested in something else. You know, some of the, some of the f regions were interested in top class leadership development that could be delivered in their end markets and in their region. So that broad approach allowed us to engage a wider set of stakeholders and really uh, sell this to them. The other challenge was around the governance. So uh, governance around the content development and management. So how do we manage the curriculum and content on an ongoing basis? Uh, because we don't want to go back into duplicating all the effort again. So that governance is very important. The governance around the system and data management as well. So that's not only about putting once in a piece of document, but what we found out Living that governance is an ongoing challenge as well. So I think these two pieces really stood up for me, which took a lot of our time and effort in terms of driving this. So I'm not one of time. Uh, that's right. So I'm putting on the video now. And after the video, you won't see me here. And Tony will come in and take you through the rest of the presentation. Enjoy the video.
And so, in a, in a blaze of communications from the CEO, from the um, COO, we launched this thing to an unsuspecting public um, in May 2011. We chose, the project board chose not to pilot, so we went straight for a full launch of a new global learning, uh, leadership curriculum, new rebuilt capability frameworks, and not only that is for the first time in BAT's history, we said it's now mandatory for all of you 12,000 managers to have a development plan. So at the end of October, when we close that development cycle, um, we can tell you that 79% um, have a, a full development plan that's signed off with our line manager. Although not mandatory, we found that we had 87% of people chose to use either the leadership capability framework assessment or functional or both um, to help them deliver their plans. And in the coming months or in the, in the months after, in the aggregation that we've done and the analysis that we've done of those development plans, we now see that we've got nearly 10,000 requests for um, uh, a learning intervention. We've got 12,000 um, identified pieces of e-learning requested and underway. And we also were able to look at the softer kind of skills, so coaching. They were all noted in their plans as well. So although we've got that data, we haven't yet analyzed it yet in such a way that we can start to look at, have we got our 70, 20, 10 mix, or are we close to it, or what are we doing about it? And OK, with 10,000 learning interventions, I doubt we'll deliver that all this week, uh, this year. But it gives us a chance now to look at those, prioritize them, and look at the, the, the learning gaps and the capability gaps, and to, to make us um, sure that where we're spending our training bucks is in the right place. Sorry, I thought you were going to mention it earlier on. So 70-20-10 mix is our, our ambition to do 70% of our learning um, off in the job or coaching with the line management. 20% is through an E, so e-learning or webinars, those kind of things, and 10% through face-to-face uh, -face learning. So that's the ambition. So a quick word about the frameworks themselves. Um, they form the basis of um, our talent acquisition, our talent management, and our talent development. Um, areas. The competency frameworks themselves, we, we have two flavors. We have our leadership capabilities and we have our functional competency frameworks. So all of the major functional areas have them, so corporate, regulatory affairs, finance, operations have several because they're plan, buy, make, move, logistics, those kind of things. And even HR has theirs as well. The functional competencies, um, let, me, let me tackle those first. They are owned by the business, and they have been developed by the business themselves with, in partnership with the HR, uh, with a consultant from the group talent um, area. Now, they are based and um, built around the operating model by understanding the organizational tasks and then the organizational capability to deliver those tasks, and then the personal capabilities that you need um, in that function to deliver business excellence. The role of the group HR um, consultant is to pull in the strategies, pull in the business excellence, get the wording right, get the frameworks right. And we used Bloom's taxonomy to give us a framework of reference for all of the, the frameworks across the board. And, that, and, and as Hassan sort of uh, talked about earlier on, that gives us a, a good framework for analysis. So what we're doing now is we're looking at gaps. On a personal basis, your gaps and your assessments will help you do your own personal development plan. At a functional level, it allows us to understand where our strengths and where our um, areas for development are and where we are going to spend our training dollars. And let's face it, when you spend anywhere up to 40 million pounds a year on training, you better know where you're spending it on. And then it gives us a sense of 
from the business side of the, um, the business point of view, are we spending it in the right place and how are we going to prioritize that spend as well? For our talent review meetings, it's going to form one part of our potential rating. So from the performance review, performance assessment, um, you will get your performance rating. And from a combination of um, elements, you will get your potential rating. That's something we're working on at the moment to enable much more um, pointed nine box, standard nine box talent management planning. And very much like the previous speaker, Jane, um, we have um, recruitment guides where we've outlined a number of potential questions depending on uh, the seniority of the people you're recruiting in those areas. And BAT has also now made those mandatory. So every, every recruitment has to use the, the leadership interspersed with selected questions from the functional recruitment guides. So acquisition, talent management, and talent development now are all going to be run through the same competency frameworks. So what's next for BAT? Well, it's certainly ambition, our ambition to um, move this uh, much further down the performance. So we don't have performance management in there or talent or succession management yet. So it's our ambition to provide all the managers with one single user experience, one place to go to for performance, for learning, for talent management. And as we roll a single HRM RMS across those 180 countries, we'll start to pull in the 60,000, uh, the full site, the non-manager set in there as well. And as you're an international company, we're further going to add a layer of complexity by adding a number of languages on top of that as well. So all in all, quite a big piece of work um, for my successor. So luckily, I'm going to step away from that one. So what was the... Uh, the approach. I'm not going to read these out to you. I think there's a, there's a couple of items that I, I will just um, think from either side. I think the very top one on the left-hand side, you cannot, um, you cannot sort of conceive of doing a project like this without having a cross-functional, cross-regional set of stakeholders. Not just stakeholders, but also your project board. Okay? They were very useful in driving um, upwards to the, the group board, as well as getting you what you need in order to do your job. And the other thing I will say is deliver on time. In a big project like this, one small piece has the potential to hold up a huge area of work. So everybody must be delivering on time. Over on the right hand, I think uh, there's never enough stakeholder engagement. I think we're still doing the stakeholder engagement from the project that we launched back in May, so I expect we'll do that for, for even a lot longer. And the final thing is don't underestimate the ongoing effort to maintain not only your competency frameworks, they should be amended, looked at, reviewed annually. BATs are anchored to the strategy, so they are forward-looking three to five years in advance. So you must always keep your frameworks that forward-looking. And the systems itself, the platform that we chose, Cornerstone, needs to be agile, it needs to be attractive. You know, if you let these things just sit there and fester for, for years, then nobody's ever going to look at them. That's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. And uh, I must say, uh, a very agile and um, attractive speaker as well. Thank you. <laughs> Who's going to be first for the question? <laughs> then how to take that. <laughs> I'll come back to you, sir. How are you doing now? Sitting down, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I could see that obviously you've used Cornerstone as yep. your uh, platform for delivering your competency models. Just a quick question. Do you think that Cornerstone has provided everything that you need or is the, the best tool that you could use to deliver those competency assessments and is there anything that you would like to do to improve it? Hmm, considering the Cornerstone team has sat behind you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no pressure. Arm, yeah. <laughs> I, let, let me answer it by saying this. Um, you don't enter into a project this size and spend this 
amount of money without doing your homework. And, and anyone that's done a project this size knows you will have engaged a number of business analysts who will have gone around and, and taken every piece of your frameworks apart. They'll have visited all your stakeholders. They'll have visited all your processes, the way you want to deliver competencies, the way you want to do your assessments. And they'll have a list like this. And they will have gone around, and we did, all of the major suppliers uh, with this list. And it's not just uh, competencies, it's learning. It's how best can we reach 180 countries. Not many people have that challenge. Um, and it was by ticking those off that list that we came to the conclusion that Cornerstone was the best fit for BAT. There are others available. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are other flavors. Um, I'm coming from telecommunication industry. And um, I need to ask a question. Uh, have you, those, those all staff, are you staff guys or you are the outsourcing people and uh, having, you know, managed services? Because this is the concept we're applying now in the uh, telecommunication industry that we're using other company services for call centers, for retail, even for franchise. So can we apply this concept on those guys or only on the employees of the company? The beauty is, I mean, we don't have any outsourcing. We are moving into a uh, uh, HR contextual model as well. So a different service delivery, but we'll have in-house. So we have in-sourcing and we'll have our own HR shared services as well. And out of HR, I mean, learning, through this learning transformation, we have already taken a step ahead of the rest of the HR, and we have set up even a small shared services sitting in our South Africa offices to support the, the whole uh, learning zone, global learning zone. So we, that's what we are looking at. But naturally, I mean, if you look at the other companies, it should be able to support uh, the outsourcing as well. The next step, when we go into the 60,000 non-managers, we potentially will be encountering some of these challenges because our trade marketing, when you look at the trade marketing field force out there in the rest of the world, they work with various partners as well, third partner, third party distributors. So we'll, ha we'll have to look into those challenges. Uh, so that's why, you know, Tony is keen to pass it on to his successor. <laughs> <laughs> I have one quick question for you and, and, and really to clarify. If you, could, if you could, in your minds, get a concept of the business value that you have created, say, over the last six months, what percentage of that business value would you have derived from the leadership competencies? And you're not allowed to say, I don't know. <laughs> but because what I'm trying to do is um, the, the scope of what you've done here. You've obviously got the good leadership. But, but how much broader is it than that is what I'm trying to assess. Well, in, in terms of the capability, it's not just leadership. Mm. It's, it's the full um, functional competency framework. And um, all the projects that, that have been used to, to review those frameworks, um, there's always been the question of the business case, um, of course. And, and we've always dodged it quite well. Um, we did look at marketing so at the moment we're going through trade marketing now i think that if you think that the, the turnover we saw earlier on is, is 42 billion pounds per annum i think if if your trademark that all goes through your trade marketing hands so i think it's it's fair to say if you make if you're able to increase the performance of the trade marketing areas by 0.1 of a percent i think you you can get a size that a sense of the size of the, just the monetary feedback um, of the, the business case. And it would just dwarf the money that we put into developing the programs. And so I think it's, it's always the case that, that in all of these programs, mm. we haven't really had to justify the, the money uh, or build the business case no. too extensively because people understand it's the right thing to do. I'll just add one comment on that one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of our savings in 2011, which I mentioned, four million uh, annual saving against our L&D leadership development spend, that largely comes from rationalization of our leadership management portfolio. But where it really makes sense for the business is where the leadership competencies and the functional competencies come in, because that's what provides us a complete integrated link. So when we do the analysis, people can see how the learnings is linked into, uh, into 
our competencies and what we are trying to do in different parts mm -hmm. of the business, how the value is added. An example of you know, trade marketing, which Tony gave, you know, can only be linked because of a competency framework sitting right in the middle. So that's what brings in a major part of our total value. So <laughs> what was the percentage? <laughs> What's the percentage of the business value derived from leadership competencies? Just leadership, I would say leadership and functional together. Mm -hmm. uh, probably 60%. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I, I got the answer, didn't I? <laughs> I? One of the things that's always interesting about interviewing is um, I, I, I've done quite a bit of interviewing with politicians. <laughs> And that ability to not answer the question is incredible. You just have to answer the same question again, the same question over again, so I apologize for that. We've got time for one more. Madam. Not so much about what you were doing, but actually you mentioned the importance of having cross-functional, cross-country project board. Just out of interest, how competent did you find them acting as a project board, or did you have to step back and go, actually, I need to tra uh, train them how to be sponsors first, and then I'll get my value out of them. I should say that I spend a lot of time with boards of directors teaching them how to be project sponsors. Right. So, yeah. I think uh, there were challenges regarding governance as well. Uh, and frankly, we went through the initial phase of six months where the governance keep on changing. And that's when we picked up our project board ourselves. So we pushed to have a project board, and we chose the people who we would like to be on the project board because otherwise it started with the CEO committee which was fine for the overall approval and direction then it got changed into HR portfolio review committee and then it went into the systems board committee so we had those changes and we wanted one consistent body who can still understand what we are trying to do and sign off on certain things and that's where we brought in the cross-functional project board and that was very helpful and we brought in those people who, uh, you know, understood it better than better than uh, many of the other senior stakeholders. So uh, it, it helped us that way. I was just going to say, if anyone has any other questions, we'll be down on stand 32. I, yeah, I was I'm going to close it by exact, saying exactly that, that both our, both our speakers, all three of our speakers will, will be at the front at the end here. So if there's any other questions to ask them, uh, do, do feel free. I mean, a great part of, of, of a conference like this where you can talk to practitioners is that you can figure out what's going to go wrong before it goes wrong. And we had a great opportunity of doing that today. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for our three speakers. Thank you.